So let me start uh, talking about uh, the material here. Today is the first class, so it's going to be relatively light. Just going to set the stage. Let me first draw a block diagram of the digital communication system. This is where we're going to uh, be uh, living in this course. And uh, then we're going to go through the, through the elements and limit the scope of, of, of what we're going to cover in this course. Uh, digital communication is huge subject there. That's pretty much all-encompassing of everything we do today. All of our contemporary systems are digital communication systems, starting from the simplest you know, uh, systems to, to the you know, satellite communication system, cellular, Wi-Fi, everything. And it has a very, you know, wide range of topics that simply cannot fit in a format of a single class. So what I'm going to do is let me draw the diagram and limit the scope and see what are the topics that we're going to focus on in this class and point you to some other classes that we teach in the department that are not necessarily carrying the title of, uh, of uh, digital communication but deal with the particular subject areas that uh, that are used in uh, digital communications. So let me just, uh, I, I thought I had a brand new. And, uh, all right. <coughs> so, block diagram. So there is an information source of some, let me just draw it real quickly and then I'll uh, talk about each element here. So this is input transducer. Then we have uh, transmitter. Channel. Then receiver. Output transducer, and information sync. So, what is the purpose of a digital communication system? The purpose of the digital communication system is to send information from information source to the information sync. Now, although it seems uh, uh, that this is satisfactory, what is kind of vague there is this whole concept of the information, right? And although, you know, we all think we know what the information is, when you start defining it in mathematical terms, it's not so easy. So, uh, even though we're going to be talking information, and later on in the course I would actually define what precisely we mean by the information, we actually limit the scope of the course right away. Instead of considering this course from here, uh, this block diagram from here to here, and discuss of what is the meaning of the information, because it has also philosophical uh, connotations to it, we're going to limit our attention uh, to this portion of the, of the system. And what does this portion of the system do? It actually assumes that uh, you have some signals that are coming in here, signals being uh, analog voltages and currents, and that the purpose of this uh, communication system in between uh, is to uh, take these signals from this point and replicate these signals at, uh, at this point, replicate uh, that over here. Now, that um, that is a narrower definition, and a lot of times in, in literature we call this electronic communication system. So electronic communication system. Difference here is now we're not concerned about whether these signals carry any information or not. What we are trying to do is receive some waveforms here and then relay them to the other part of the globe and rep replicate these same signals on the other 
on the other side. Now, let me talk about these individual blocks. Um, purpose, um, uh, so uh, what are these, these blocks here? Source is a uh, source of information. This is usually some kind of uh, entity that produces information that we need to send to the other side. This is me speaking, this is somebody playing music, somebody typing on a computer, right? The, the source is usually in this world, and uh, in order to translate what the source is trying to, is producing into something that we can relate to the other location, we have to have uh, something that is called input transducer. That's a device that on one end interfaces with the source, and in the other end produces the signals that we can use in the electronic communication system. This is your microphone, this is the camera, this is your the keyboard, right? It allows you to transition from this world into the world of the signals that that uh, that is the world that uh, this electronic communication system works. Now, the major uh, on the other end, let's say we replicated the signals here, you're going to have an output transducer, which is an inverse element associated with this one, that takes these signals that are voltages and currents and uh, translates them into a form that is understandable by the signal of the information. So if this is a speech signal, somebody speaking, this, this is a microphone that produces voltages and currents. This would be a speaker that will take these voltages and currents and, and create a acoustic sound that can be played to someone, right? Now, design and uh, theory behind these transducers is, is a usually separate topic, a very interesting one, but it's outside of the scope of this course. We're going to assume that, uh, that uh, these transducers are already in place, and we're going to be focusing on these three elements in the middle. Now, what are these three elements in the middle? There is a, this TX, stands for transmitter. The second one is a channel. And then the third one is receive. This Rx, that's a receive. Now, what does the transmitter do? Transmitter uh, converts these signals into uh, into another set of signals that are suitable for transmission over a particular channel. What uh, happens in, in communication systems is when you look at the signals that are coming from transducers, they always come, or most of the time, come in what we call baseband. They're low pass uh, uh, signals, uh, usually band limited, that are direct translation of, of the, this of the waveforms generated by source into electronic waveforms. What are the examples? Let's say if I speak, what comes out of here is what we refer to as speech signal. Uh, for, for guys who are uh, coming from communication theory, what's the, what's the bandwidth of the speech signal? At least telephone speech signal. Four kilohertz, right? So that signal exists from zero, theoretic from zero to four kilohertz. Now, uh, if I need to transmit this over wireless channel, can I transmit this signal directly? No, because at such a low frequencies, you have to have huge antennas and, and it's impractical. So for example, the purpose of the receiver would be to perform the frequency translation of the, of the signal to a different frequency band that is suitable for the transmission over the, over the communication channel. So let me put that here as a note. Transmitter. Converts electric signals into waveforms suitable for transmission over channel. This is not an easy task, and usually it, um, it uh, performs several tasks to, you know, in the process of converting it, you know, electric signal to the waveforms. 
that are suitable for transmission. In a digital communication system, the, I'm going to list some of these tasks that the transmitter needs to perform. So let's say uh, something called signal formatting. And this would involve compending. That's a range compression of the signal. Thresholding. So essentially working on the analog signal to make sure that it, it is within a certain range and within a certain properties that allow its further process. Then the next step would be your sampling and quantization. Then uh, source encoding. Sampling and quantization, important step where you go from, you travel from the analog world into digital. You're taking your samples of the analog signal and converting them into, into samples and then you're quantizing those samples uh, against the range of the discrete values. Now source encoding means translating those samples into ones and zeros. Then a transmitter may do encryption. may do uh, channel encoding, so I'm going to continue here. May do multiplexing, which is uh, allowing multiple communication uh, communications to use the same channels. Very, very, very seldom any particular transmission has an exclusive use of a given channel. So you have to share the channel among many different uh, uh, users and that's called multiplexing and uh, we'll talk about how this is accomplished. Then there's something called pulse shaping. Uh, modulation. Amplification and filtering. Ah. And filtering. Frequency translation and so on. All right, there are other tasks that, uh, that we can mention here. So the list is pretty comprehensive. The, the, uh, this course is not going to cover all of these subjects. So let me uh, talk about which one are we going to cover. We're going to talk about sampling and quantization in a great detail. That's uh, going to be a good part. We're going to start from, from there. Then we're going to be talking about source encoding. Uh, encryption is beyond the scope. Uh, channel coding, then we have a separate course that we teach, which is called error control coding which is essentially uh, how do you add redundancy into your scheme so that you can help the receiver decode a particular uh, stream of data. I'm going to mention that in a generic sense because we're going to cover Shannon's encoding theorem and I'm going to talk about uh, channel encoding from the information theory perspective, but the actual techniques are not going to be in this course. They're going to be in a, in a um, course that is dedicated to nothing but uh, channel encoding. We're going to be talking somewhat about multiplexing. We're going to be talking about pulse shaping because it turns out you need to talk about pulse shaping once you start then limiting the communication saying that you have only a portion of the frequency axis where you need to fit in. We're going to talk about great extent about modulation. And uh, part of the modulation is always going to be frequency translation of your baseband signal to some, to some uh, other frequency range. So there are quite a few tasks that the transceiver has to do, transmitter has to do, and we're going to cover one, two, three, four, five, six of them, uh, at, at least to some level. You know, you know there's always going to be more detail, but, uh, but uh, this is left to some subsequent courses. Now, the next element in that Bohr diagram is channel. 
And what is a channel? Channel is uh, usually seen as a physical medium that is used for uh, communication. So this is a physical medium. used to send signal from transmitter to receive. Okay. There, is a, there are a, quite a few different channels that we communicate through. And uh, uh, the simple, I guess, uh, breakdown of what exists there, I'm going to provide here. Uh, this is a physical medium, so every physical medium comes with its physical properties. Right? Uh, this is a, but this is a theoretical course, so we're not going to be dealing too much about physical aspects of the channel. What our goal is going to be is to abstract the channel into a mathematical model, and I'm going to cover that slide a little bit later today. But let's go through at least some idea of what the channels exist, and then we'll talk about a little bit later how you model channels. So, because we're going to be interested is the mathematical abstraction associated with these channels. And what you will see is once you start doing that, then large classes of the channels can be modeled as, as a certain mathematical model. And this is very helpful to us because uh, then we can uh, write our equations and, and uh, explain and understand what is actually happening at the abstract level. So, if I start by saying communications channels, well, I have two large groups. One is what we call a wire line, meaning that uh, there is a physical wire of some sort between the transmitter and the receiver. And then we have what we call wireless. And when it comes to wireline channels, we have two types. We have optical, and then we have electric. And uh, when it comes to optical wireline channels, these are your optical fiber channels. And we have actually two courses that are one of them dedicated to just optical fiber technology. How you, you know, uh, what kind of uh, fibers are there? How do you design the transmitter circuitry and receiver circuitry around? And then we have a course, Optical Communications, that looks at this from a system, system level standpoint. But, uh, so this is your fiber. And then electrical, these are your channels where you use, uh, here you use light to transmit signal from one end to the other. In the wireline electrical channels, you actually use voltages and currents. And there are several examples of this channel I have here. A uh, twisted pair, which is a uh, kind of basic channel in communication. That's that uh, blue and white wire that's twisted around. Then you have a coaxial cable, waveguide. So these are some examples of your wireline electrical channels. You have physical connection in some form of wire between transmitter and receiver, and uh, you either use optical signal, which means some lasers and, and uh, electromagnetic waves in the optical portion of the spectrum, or you use electrical signals uh, to send, uh, uh, to communicate between transmitter and receiver. Wireless channels, we again have, I guess, three types. You have wireless optical, which are usually some infrared channels or, or uh, uh, essentially electromagnetic channels where you communicate with electromagnetic waves of the optical portion of the spectrum. You have wireless radio channels, which, which are by far the most common type of the wireless channels. And then you have wireless uh, acoustic channels, which are used for communicating in the media where uh, uh, electromagnetic waves do not propagate far. Your underwater communication is, uh, is an example of, of uh, where you have a channel that's wireless, but also acoustic, right? So your transducers and your transmitting receivers have to work in that environment where your signal now 
not using electromagnetic waves but acoustic waves because they propagate in this particular uh, the typical environment. Now, uh, one common thing about the channel, any one of these channels, is that they distort your signal. That's true for every single one of these channels. What does this mean? This means whatever I put in a channel and whatever comes out of the channel is going to be different. Right? And there are, uh, so I would say common about channels, and common property of the channel, signal is distorted. Again, what that means is whatever I put into the channel on one end from the transmitter side and whatever comes out of the channel is going to be somehow different. And when it comes to distortion, this is essentially how these two signals are going to be different. We identify two types of the distortion. One type is what we call additive distortion. And what that means is the, what comes out is something that is originated from the signals that are placed in and then in addition to that I'm going to have some other signals or some other corruption that is coming from external sources. Typical example of that is a noisy channel. Right? You have your signal coming out, hopefully as little distorted as possible, but in addition to your signal you're going to have some other, in, other signal that is not what you have sent, that exists there just because uh, other sources of uh, motion of the electrons in, in, the, in the wires here. So let me, where should I, I'm going to keep the block diagram and, and use this bottom portion of the, of the board. Excuse me, Professor. Uh -huh. I have a question. How do we treat the channel abstractly? Because most of the time, I think the channel is, should be like physicals. But you know, in some models, they have like you know mm -hmm. communication system. They have like you know channels from one until eleven. And okay, the how do we treat the channels in abstract way? Well, part of that you already know, because you just came out of the linear system, uh, linear system uh, theory. If the channel is linear, which most of our channels that are of a practical use are to a great extent, then what channel acts uh, is as linear filter. And we spend the whole course talking about what happens when you put the signal into a linear filter. And we learn that you can do convolution, you can do Fourier analysis, and all of that stuff. So this is where this material comes into play. We're going to actually say, uh, in abstract sense, this channel is a low-pass filter, or this channel is a band-pass filter, or this channel is a low-pass filter with an additive white noise of the white Gaussian type. So, so this is how we're going to be modeling the channels. And this is going to fit a lot of these, 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 these uh, channel types here. When I talk about electrical channels, most of them are going to be low-pass filters with additive white Gaussian noise. The only difference between them are going to be some parameters, but from the mathematical standpoint, they can all be successfully modeled using, using this, uh, uh, this model. When I talk about wireless radio channel, this is going to be filtered, but guess what? It's going to be a band pass filter, and it's going to be frequency selective, and it's going to be time varying, right? So that's, uh, that's the, the, the channel that we need to deal with when we talk about the radio channel. But once I go to that level of abstraction, then our communication theory and our linear system knowledge kicks in, and I'm at home, right? I know, give me this input, this is impulse response, here's the output, right? Yes. right. So, so that's what uh, that stuff is used for. Now, talking back, going back to the... Uh, uh, the distortion. So whatever goes into channel, what comes out is not the same thing. And uh, there are two types of distortion. <coughs> uh, 
one type is additive. And what that means is what comes out uh, has two sources, right? One is your signal, but the other one is the things that are, that are appearing in the output that not necessarily depend on your signal. And there are other types of so uh, output of the channel. contains other signals beyond what is caused by input. Examples may be maybe noise, interference, So this is your additive distortion. And then there can be something that uh, we call non-additive. And this now is an even larger uh, category where you have a spectral modification of your signal. The signal may be filtered somehow. Or you may have intermodulation products. Or you have all sorts of things that are corrupting your, your signal. So let me just here put uh, uh, Examples of would be uh, spectral modification. Or filtering. Nonlinear distortion. And so on. Now, in, in terms of uh, theoretical analysis, additive ones are much easier to understand. And uh, mathematical tools that we use for their for treatment of additive distortion channels is much easier. And most of this course we're going to be, except maybe at the very, very end, we're going to be dealing mostly with additive distortion in terms of, in terms of the noise. Later, when we talk about uh, uh, transmission to a band limited channels, then we are actually dealing with a spectral modification of your signal and uh, and we need to address that see what what comes as a result of uh, all the of the channel now being uh, frequency selective uh, to your uh, frequency selective and, and disturbing various components of the signal now I realize I apologize I'm going to start writing a little bit larger because all of you are squinting and stuff so <laughs> <coughs> I apologize for that go ahead please Yeah, about the wireless optical communication. Yes. What's the difference between the free space optical communication? That's it. That's that's the same thing. Yes. You know, wireless. When you say wireless optical communication, that has doesn't have to be free space, right? Uh, but usually it is, because what happens is uh, with optical signal, as long as it encounters something it's gone, right? You cannot shine a light to this wall and then reasonably detect it on the other side, right? So, so uh, although by the, if, if you want to nitpick and say, okay, that they are not the same thing, practically they're the same thing because we use optical communication usually through free space. You have lasers that are very focused in terms of light and then there, there's a diode that you need to hit on the other end. And uh, usually your signal follows to free space. And if there's something in between, then you lose the communication. Right? Uh, as I was mentioning in the previous class today, uh, the most, uh, it used to be, it used to be a kind of niche area or smaller area because it covered really just few meters communication, let's say your remote control or, or the link between your uh, PC and a printer and so on, like a real near communication. But with us starting to conquer the space and, and the areas where you actually have a situation where there is nothing in between transmitter and receiver, this becomes uh, really, really appealing for these kind of communications. So, but uh, to answer your question short, you know, uh, optical communication is usually through free space. Alright, so let's take a look at 
uh, look at uh, the last guy on the block, this is this receiver here. So we already mentioned that We already mentioned that one of the most significant things here is that the whatever comes into the channel comes and the output is stored. It comes quite a bit changed. And uh, the purpose of this block here is to undo what the channel has done because we need to recover uh, our uh, bits and bytes that uh, we have placed at the input of this transfer. So that's the task of the receiver. So the, the function of the receiver is to recover the original signal. So I guess here, the receiver uh, recovers original signal that was passed to the transmitter. Now, uh, in the case of digital communication system, this means several things. You know, the <coughs> receiver is usually the most, in every communication system, the receiver is usually the most complicated piece. The, re the reason for it is the task it has is the most complicated task. It needs to receive the signal that has been heavily distorted by the channel in some cases and then decide what is it that it is receiving and then recover all the information and present it to the user. Now let me first go through some of the tasks that the receiver needs to do. So frequency translation, right? It actually needs to do pretty much all the complementary things that the transmitter did. If the transmitter transferred the signal from the baseband to, to let's say, UHF band for the wireless transmission, then the receiver needs to bring it from UHF back to the baseband. So that's uh, the frequency <coughs> translation. Uh, amplification and filter. Then demodulation. Uh, Demultiplex. Decipher. Decoding, I guess. Decoding and error control uh, error correction. Uh, deciphering the same as the encryption, deconstruction, <coughs> and so on. Just to name a few, there's diversity, there's all sorts of things that uh, is not in the list. In this course, we're going to be talking about some of these, like we're going to be talking as frequency translation as a necessary part of your demodulation because when you uh, send the bandpass signals to demodulate them you have to do the frequency translation to the basement. Part of that is amplification and filtering, demodulation, that's what we're going to be talking about. Briefly about demultiplexing. Decoding and error correction, that's the part that's out beyond the scope of this course. This is part of the error control coding course that uh, talks about nothing but how we actually encode and decode. The deciphering is also beyond the scope of this course. This talks uh, about general methods, how you, how you encrypt your uh, uh, data stream to protect the privacy of, of the communication. Reconstruction, formatting, that's uh, what we're going to be doing here as well. Now, before I 
before I continue, let me point out why, explain why did I uh, highlighted this two here. <coughs> now, the and, and, and it, it looks benign, but it's a it's a it's a center of why are we going into digital? Why the, all the modern systems are being digital communication systems? Think about what is the task of the receiver in an analog communication system. In an analog communication system, I send a signal, and the receiver task is to recover that particular signal. So there's a voice, and I need to, the voice is modulated onto the carrier, and the receiver needs to bring back this analog signal. A lot of times, because of the channel distortion, distortion mixes with the signal within the same frequency band occupied by the signal. In, in, in the example we talked about earlier, voice is from 0 to 4 kilohertz. There will be noise in 0 to 4 kilohertz. And in most communication systems, analog communication systems, once the noise is there, it becomes part of your signal. And all you can do is, you know, get rid of what is outside of the band that belongs to signal. Whatever is inside becomes part of the part of the signal itself, and all you can do is amplify. But when you do that, you're amplifying both signal and the noise. So in the analog world, the receiver needs to reconstruct signals. Now in the digital world, our signals are known to the receiver. We don't send unknown voice samples. What we send are symbols. We send an alphabet. In the most simple case, I'm going to send either one or a zero. The receiver does not need to recover anything. What the receiver needs to do is to recognize what has been sent. Recognition of what has been sent is much easier task, right? Let me try to sketch what, what I mean by that. Let's say this is, this is what has been sent. And let's say this is what has been received. Uh, this is what has been received. In analog world, all you can do is multiply this. But the digital uh, amplify this, right? And, and, and this distortion here is going to be part of the signal because it's cross spectrum and, and uh, the, a lot of times uh, the, the analog receivers have no capability of eliminating anything that is uh, cross spectrum with your, with your signal. But in a digital world, the digital receiver looks at this and all that it needs to do is answer. Was it one or was it zero? And once it knows it's one, it pretty much throws away this signal and says, oh, this was this, right? And it's a perfect reconstruction in one step, eliminated all the noise that has been accumulated. That's why uh, I highlighted two here, because what we are really trying to understand, what are the symbols that are fed to the transmitter? We are not concerned about the waveforms and trying to recover the signals. As soon as I can say that this was 1 or 0, I have decoded, decoded my uh, signal perfectly if I didn't make a mistake, and then I have eliminated the noise. So I'll highlight that as we, as we go along, for, for you who, can, who, who come from a, a communication theory where we dealt mostly with analog systems, over there, we were talking about signal-to-noise ratio, right? Because everything that was noise and what was cross-spectrum with the signal stayed there. And what we had to make sure is that after demodulation, our signal was much stronger than the noise. Here, I'm going to be actually using different metrics, and I'm going to be saying, okay, at every instant, I'm, I'm making a decision what has been sent, and the uh, uh, principal measure of performance of your receiver is going to be how often do I make an error in my judgment, whether it was one or zero, and this would be a bit error rate or symbol error rate or some other metric of that nature. So the reason why we go digital is because the task of recognizing what has been sent is much easier than the task of recovering the original signal that has been sent. And uh, and uh, as I, I guess that's why you know, we're, uh, we're using digital communication systems. So uh, let's uh, uh, talk a little bit about mathematical models of the channel. That's what uh, uh, we kind of went through 
little bit of tax, uh, of, of kind of what channels we have. And now we're gonna, this is the last uh, part of the course where I'm gonna be dealing at that physical level. Well, from now on, we're gonna treat channel as mathematical models. And let's just go through some of the common mathematical models and discuss their applicability. Uh, and then the uh, importance relative to this particular course. Excuse me, Professor. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Okay. Is that are uh, are we going to have just only one dealing whenever we have the you know communication system in just only distortion, or we have another issue with that? I mean, like you have a loss in some part of something. Yeah, yeah. The part of uh, non-additive. Uh, we remember distortion. We have additive and non-additive. One type of non-additive distortion is multiplicative distortion, which means that your signal comes multiplied by some constant that it, it, at best, right, that constant is going to be always much smaller than one, which says that what comes out of the channel is usually severely attenuated, and that is going to be part of, the, of, of our analysis, right? This is going to be in every channel. Whatever you send in the channel, because uh, just, uh, just uh, every channel is lossy, the signal is going to attenuate. In some cases, it's going to attenuate less in the wireline channels. It's going to be, let's say, 3 dB per every 100 feet. In wireless channels, it's going to be 20 dB or 100 times every decade in distance, at, at least. Right? So that's going to be part of our channel model. Right? That's one of the distortions. So there will be a glitch on that uh, channel, I mean, like... A glitch? What's a glitch? I mean, like, something, uh, noise. In there. Yeah, yeah. So let's let's go over some models of the of the channel, some mathematical models. <coughs> For channels. Um, we're gonna uh, look at three channel models in this course. First one is going to be additive noise channel. And uh, the second one is going to be linear time invariant. Linear time invariant. Filter channel. And then the third type of the channel that we're going to consider is going to be linear, but this time time variant filter channel. Okay. So let's uh, look at each one of them individually. So one is your additive noise channel, additive noise channel. The mathematical model for this channel looks like this. Here's your signal that you put into the channel. The signal is going through attenuation of, of some value. And um, you can, and the signal is also corrupted with an additional uh, signal here, which is your noise. N of T. What comes out is R of T. So this is your input. These two guys together form uh, additive noise channel. Okay. The, in this block diagram, let me just spell it out for the in this case, and then you know, for the next one, I'll, I'll keep the same notation. S of T is our transmitted signal. This um, A, or N of T, sorry, N of T is going to be additive noise. <coughs> the important part here is that the, this addition here, that's why we call it additive. It's in addition to the signal. Noise doesn't have to be additive, you know. I can just, uh, you know, put times here and then it becomes multiplicative. And then it's much more difficult than, than 
if you just uh, add. Now, uh, R of t is your received signal. And then this A is a channel gain or attenuation. The way how I draw it here, it's, it's gain. Now, what happens here? Let's say this is S of t as I feed it into the channel. And let's say it's some signal that looks like this. Well, what comes out of the channel is going to be smaller in power. And then with the, with the noise on top of it. So if this is S of t, this is going to be R of t. Mathematically, R of t is going to be A S of t plus N of t. So that's uh, our model for, for uh, uh, additive noise channel. Now, a lot of times we uh, attach another descriptor to the channel by talking about the character of this noise. If this noise is Gaussian, this is additive Gaussian channel. If on the top of being Gaussian, the noise is white as well, so this, this is additive white Gaussian noise channel. Okay. Or it may be not non-white, in which case we have additive Gaussian colored noise channel. Right? So we have, uh, we, usually we say additive and then attach the attribute to what kind of noise is being added to the signal and the channel is there always. Now, let's uh, look at it. This is the simplest of all channels, right? This is as simple as it can get. And even in this simple scenario, you actually have two types of distortion that you're dealing with. So this channel <coughs> introduces two types of distortion. one is attenuation. What comes out is much smaller in power than what uh, was presented to the channel. And uh, the second one is additive noise. Okay. Uh, additive noise is obviously additive distortion. This is non-additive. This is multiplicative kind of distortion. Now, let's look at the model for the linear time invariant channel. In this case, here's the block diagram. You have your signal S of t coming into something that's a linear filter. How do we characterize our linear filters? Well. We can do it in time domain, or we can do it in frequency domain. If we want to describe the filter in a time domain, what are we talking about? Hmm? Which one? Impulse response. Impulse response. No, it's impulse response. So in a time domain, I, I can specify this by knowing impulse response. If I'm in the other domain, in the frequency domain, then I'm going to provide frequency response. What's the relationship between the two of them? We are Fourier transform pairs of each other. Now, at the output of this channel, we're going to have also noise, and then here's our output signal R of t. So now this entire entire block here constitutes your channel. Now, do I know how to calculate the output of this kind of channel? Yes. In this case, output R of t if I want to stay in a time domain, my R of t is going to be what? It's going to be S of t. Then this funny symbol, what is this? Convolution. Convolution, S of t plus H of t, and in addition to uh, additive noise here. If I want to 
uh, write the same thing in a frequency domain, then my R of f is going to be s of f times h of f plus n of f, whatever that means. So this, these are the Fourier, uh, uh, Fourier uh, transform pairs of each one of these time domains. <coughs> Now here, uh, it is assumed that this age of t stays constant over period of communication. Stays constant over communication period. <coughs> We're dealing with a filter, but that filter does not change over time. This uh, symbol here, as I said, is convolution. So you remember S of t convolved with H of t is an integral <coughs> when tau goes from minus infinity to plus infinity, S of tau times H of t minus tau d tau, or which is the same thing, tau goes from minus infinity to plus infinity, S of t minus tau H of tau. So this is how we calculate uh, the output of the signal. And here, you know, it looks, uh, looks a little bit more complicated, but it's still very simple. If I know S of t, give me H of t, you know, and I sit down, you know, have a cup of coffee and evaluate my convolution, right? right. If I know how to do it analytically, fine. If not, I do it numerically. But this is a nice operation that, uh, for the most part, um, I know how to do. The problem here is the nature of this n of t. Uh, S of t is usually in digital communication no signal. You know, I know what I'm sending, and it's usually of a given shape. It's in the most basic representation either one or minus one. Right? H of t in in a time time uh, invariant. Uh, uh, filter channels, I would usually get that as well, you know, either through some uh, data sheet or through some measurements, but H of t I know. So this part here of R of t, I can calculate analytically for every, every S of t. This N of t, although I write it here as a signal, is a random process, which means N of t, I don't know what it is. And what uh, that means is, I can really never predict R of t uh, uh, fully, and all I can do is predict this portion and talk about uh, what happens here in probabilistic terms. Right? And that's the that's the that's true here. That's also true here. I just forgot to mention. You know, R of t, a s of t part I can predict, but this one I have to talk in probabilistic terms. In other words. This underlying thing I can predict based on knowing what the attenuation is, but this jangly line on the top, I can only speak in terms of you know, the st the statistical terms. <coughs> now, um, what are the distortions that I have in this case? Let's look at uh, here in the previous case, we, we, we had two. Let's talk about what are the distortions in a linear time invariant filter channel. signal changes as it properties. The power of the signal changes because every medium dissipates the signal and what comes out, you can never collect all the energy that you put in. Um, there is a, se a second one which is addition of the noise. These two are the same types of distortions we had in the previous channel, but there's a new one and this is modification of the
or signal spectrum. Magnitude and phase. This is uh, essentially explained by better by this term here. Right? <coughs> what the filter channel does, it modifies modifies the frequency content of your signal. Now you all come from a Fourier background, right? You all see our signals as a fine composition of multiple sinusoids that are that somehow seem to be arranged in a special manner to form this signal. What that means, I, I, I have taken these sinusoidal, scaled them appropriately in the magnitude domain, aligned them appropriately in the time or the phase domain, and that's how this signal came to be. Now, because the filter, the channel is a filtering, has a filtering characteristics, what it does, it will look each individual sinusoidal, and what does the filter do to a sinusoid? It can only do two things. It can change its magnitude or it can change its phase. It can never change its frequency because it's a linear filter. No new frequencies at the up. So now if you look at this signal through your Fourier glasses, it's a whole bunch of sinusoidals. Now this filter changed the magnitude and phase of some of them or maybe a lot of them. And what comes out now doesn't look like the signal that you've sent in anymore. In the case of the uh, of the linear, uh, of the case of the additive noise channel, the underlying dotted line followed the shape of the signal that you've placed in. But here, you know, you may actually feed S of T that looks, let's say, like this. And then what comes out is the signal now that uh, looks somewhat like this. Right? So it's a significant change in the shape. You would recognize this is a result of a low pass filtering because it gets rid of the high frequency components. And then on the top of that, you know, you would end up having this additive noise. So the shape of this may be, may be different than the shape of the original signal. In this case, it's a relatively mild distortion, just a low pass filtering, but in some cases it may be actually substantial. So we need to deal with this now. The filter, but then again, remember why is why are we in digital? Because I can still look at it in this and I say, oh, okay, this was mine, right? And even though I've lost a whole bunch of sinusoidals and they changed their magnitudes, as long as I can squint <laughs> and look at it and it looks like one of the symbols that I had transmitted, I'm still okay. Okay. Do you have to, Do you need to treat the signals like a clock file, or something like that? Because you say it one. Why it should be one? No, I'm making a decision. I look at this and I oh. make a decision. Right? That's what the receiver does. Okay. Maybe one, maybe two. I'm just giving an example. Okay. Now, let's take a look at um, the linear time variant. That's the third one. Now we are adding another level of complexity here. Here's S of T. And uh, now I have impulse response of this filter, H of T, but at any at the given time tau. This impulse response changes from time to time. If I look at it now, and a few milliseconds from now, this H of T will be different. Right? And then I still have a noise here that I'm going to add to this channel. And this is going to be my output, but now at a given time, tau. Right? The output will change. Even though, let's say, I feed the same signal, but because the impulse response changes, the output will, will change. So now, how do we calculate the output of this channel? Well, R of t at a given time, tau, is going to be now uh, let me just first write it as S of t convolved with my impulse response at a given time tau and plus my noise n of t. If I want to expand on this, this is going to be integral 
when some mu goes from minus infinity to plus infinity, s of mu, h of um, t minus mu at the time tau d mu plus t. So my math is, stays the same, but now I would have to be doing many, many convolutions because my <coughs> impulse response changes all the time, and as a result, the output changes all the time, right? As a, as a function of the changing impulse response. So let me um, let me give you an examples that are associated with these two channel types. Uh, first example of a linear time invariant channel, filter channel. <coughs> So, linear time invariant channel is your um, wireline guided wave channel, electrical channel. Those guys that we had, you remember, we had the taxonomy here, so it was wireline and then electrical channel, yeah, cool. twisted yeah. pair, coaxial cable, your waveguide, and so on. All of these channels can be modeled with a frequency response that looks like this. So this is a frequency response. That looks like this. H of F magnitude, right? So in a, in a uh, nutshell, they are all behaving as the low pass filters. They, for each one of them, I can identify something that we refer to as cutoff frequency, usually referred to as FC, and that's where the frequency response magnitude falls by 3 dB. If we are in a, in a linear domain, then this is 0 0.707, right, or 1 over square root of 2. What is, uh, what is a parameter that we care about for all of these channels is how large is this FC, you know, how wide is this low pass filter. And depending on what kind of wireline channel you have, FC may have different, uh, different values. For your kind of orientation of what these values are, if we're talking about twisted pair, this FC is around 100 kilohertz, right? So just order of magnitude. So uh, that's that kind of limits how wide my signal can be. Because if I have my signal smaller, let's say than 100 kilohertz, then this channel is going to be fine. Right? It's not gonna, uh, it's not gonna distort my signal heavily. But if I try to squeeze one megahertz signal, uh, S of t that has spectrum that's one megahertz wide, good part of the spectrum is gonna be gone. Right? And what comes out is gonna be uh, distorted to the point of not being able to recognize it at all. So for twisted pair, FC is 100 kilohertz. For coaxial cable. FC uh, can, can be up to 100 megahertz, and for waveguide, FC can be, let's say, 100 gigahertz. Now, these are some very, very rough numbers. I, I gave them here to you so that you get the feel, and they're deliberately hundreds. <coughs> so 100 kilohertz, that's how much of a bandwidth you can get in a box of the twisted pair, you know, usually 10, 20 megahertz, but I said 100 for the coaxial cable and 20, 30, maybe 60 gigahertz for the waveguide. So a little bit less than these boundaries. Go ahead. I don't get it about the meaning of FC. What is actually the actual meaning of FC? Why, why do we need to care about the FC? Why do we need to have that? All right. Do you understand this plot? 
Yeah. That's a frequency response. So when you talk about a low pass filter, what you need to know is the cutoff frequency, right? And that's how wide this filter is. Right? After we, we usually say after FC is where the stop band starts, right? This is where the filter starts attenuating. What you're going to learn in this course is that uh, the bandwidth of your signal depends on your symbol rate. In a most uh, elementary scenario where you are encoding one bit per symbol, the, the bandwidth of your signal in a frequency domain is going to be dictated by the bits per second that you transmit, right? And no wonder that they're so related that a lot of times people use them interchangeably. When they are when they when they say what is your bandwidth, they really mean what is your data rate, right? right. But uh, but uh, you know they are proportional to one another. So think about this: I connect transmitter and receiver, and I want the data rate on these two to be 100 megabits per second. Is a twisted pair good? candidate for that. No. No, why? Because its bandwidth is much smaller 100. than the data rate. I have to do pretty fancy multi-level encoding and so on to make sure that these two pass, that, that, that I can connect, right? So why do we know, need to know FC? Because fundamentally FC is going to limit the speed on your communication in this particular channel. And in this course you're going to learn that there's a, there's a really significant trade-off here between bandwidth, which is FC, the data rate, that the number of bits per second that you can send to this channel, and then the power that you use. It's always three things. You, you would never step out of Ohm's law. <laughs> so what is it? That's so three things? Bandwidth. Three things. Power, power yes. bandwidth, <coughs> and, data, and rate. data rate. So and these two, are, these, these two are, are interchanged and somewhere in the middle of the course, we actually link all of them together in one beautiful equation that's called Shannon's, uh, Shannon's, oh, Shannon's capa capacity yeah. formula, right? Yes. That will tell us the relationship between power, data rate, and the bandwidth of your channel. Right? So that's why we need to know FC. But as a, as a rule of thumb, if you have a channel that's, that has particular bandwidth, your data rate is going to be comparable to the bandwidth. If you want to signal with one megabit per second, you better have a, something like a one megahertz channel. Otherwise, you, you're, you're going to be you're going to be either inefficient on your signaling using too big of a channel for your signal, or too constrained in terms of power, where you have to you know do a lot of uh, have to use a lot of power to push the signal. Just uh, one, one uh, short example here. So this is a linear time invariant channel. Example two is going to be your is a linear time invariant channel. Example of a linear time invariant channel is your wireless channel. Why is it uh, time invariant? Well, let's let's just do a simple drawing here. This is your transmitter and this is the receiver. Now, what do I say about uh, linear time variant channel? What changes is this impulse response. So do this mind experiment. Let's send an impulse here. And what happens is there is a signal traveling straight from the transmitter to the receiver. There's a signal going to this building here and coming back to the receiver. There's a signal bouncing from the ground and hitting the receiver. So if I do this now, if I plot this as my top, and this is T, and I look at what happens at any given tau, I sending an impulse, I'm going to get for every different tau, I'm going to get different impulse response. We talked about this in our RF propagation class. How do we measure this? We measure this through our power delay profile, right? And then power delay profile changes as a function of time. Impulse response changes as a function of time. Because 
you know, as, as this moves through the landscape, the, it will receive different, uh, different impulses at different timing, at different magnitudes, so your age of t is constantly going to be changing. And uh, this is the channel that we have to communicate, and you know very well that uh, this, this, uh, we have to overcome this. How do we do that? Any, any idea? Diversity. Diversity. Uh, Maxing. But how do we, diversity helps you if, if this is a narrow band chain. But what if it's a wide band chain? Equalizing. Equalizing or spread spectrum or making it narrow band like through FDM. So we have a ways of dealing with it. But what I'm trying to stress here is the channel is a lot of times going to be and the types of, of distortion you have on a channel are going to very much dictate uh, how you design your transmitter receiver. And uh, there are some courses here, RF propagation being one, where we do nothing but teach about the channel, right? The whole course is spent on understanding what happens when I send this signal into wireless environment and before it reaches the receiver. And same is with optical communication, we talk about optical communication. All right, so I'm not going to dwell too much here, you know, we're, we're, you know, we're, I think, run out of time before we get here, but we're going to spend quite a bit of time on additive white Gaussian noise channel and additive white Gaussian filter channel uh, in this course.